my name is Chad Griffin. I'm the president of the board of the American Foundation for Equal Rights. Um, you heard arguments today from the city attorney of San Francisco, the media coalition, um, and attorneys on behalf of the plaintiffs, uh, Ted Boutrous on behalf of the plaintiffs. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we keep trying. <laughs> There's got to be some way to stay. Theodore Boutrous on behalf of the plaintiffs. Christine Van Aken on behalf of the city and county of San Francisco. And also joining us today uh, is city attorney Dennis Herrera. Uh, as you know, the city and county have been with us throughout this case, and we've worked side by side uh, with Dennis and his team. Um, and so I think on our press conference call last week, as we were going in to today's hearing, uh, there really is one question, and what do they have to hide? Um, and I think you were able to hear both sides uh, in court today, um, our side articulate why uh, that the public should have access to what happened in this trial, um, and I think you were able to hear um, the opposition, uh, the anti-marriage uh, proponents of Prop 8, attempt to art articulate um, why the public tapes, why, why the trial tapes should be hidden forever from the American public. Um, and I think Mr. Boutrous in the city and county of San Francisco did a very good job of showing you exactly what the opponents do not want the public to hear. Um, and so with that, I will turn the podium over to Ted Boutrous on behalf of the plaintiffs, followed by the city and county of San Francisco. Thank you, Chad. Hello, everyone. Um, it, it, we have a strong tradition in this country of open access to the courts, to trials, to judicial records, and that's what today was all about. We have the ultimate classic judicial record. We have a verbatim audio depiction of the, the trial that took place in this courthouse over 20 months ago, in which, which led to Chief Judge Walker striking down Proposition A as unconstitutional. There is no reason in the world why the American people shouldn't be able to see that trial from start to finish. We did not hear a reason today at all from the Pro Proposition A proponents. I was waiting for something, something new, some some concern, Mr. Thompson referenced their concerns, but he never said really what they are because it's they have no evidence. This is a, a refrain we use during the trial. They had no evidence, no no indication of anything that would happen that wouldn't be positive uh, if these tapes were released. And, and and I think it's telling under the First Amendment there needs to be compelling reasons to keep the judicial record secret. We didn't hear any reasons. You, we also heard from Tom Burke representing a coalition of media organizations talking about the public's uh, rights of access and the public benefit. One of the chief reasons the Supreme Court has said that there's a strong presumption of access to judicial records is so the public can see what happens in a trial. The proponents here, as I think all of you know, have all along attacked the notion of a trial, attacked the judge, Judge Walker, without any basis, made false attacks, that's all the more reason for the public to be able to see for itself what happened in the trial, which Judge Walker conducted uh, in utmost fairness, let the proponents put on any evidence they wanted. All they could muster were their two witnesses, Mr. Blankenhorn and, and, and Dr. Miller. And, um, and as you saw today, uh, there, another reason why it makes no sense to keep the trial video secret is that there are all these reenactments. Everything is public. You can get everything out there except the real thing. And, and under those circumstances, there's no basis for keeping this secret. And so for, for uh, the, the American public to be able to see the testimony on both sides, whatever your view is about marriage equality, you can see the evidence, make your own determinations, and also see uh, what a fair proceeding led to the, the, the judge's ruling striking down this discriminatory law. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dennis Herrera. Thank you, Ted. First, I want to compliment the, um, the job that Ted Boutros, Christine Van Aken, and Tom Burke did about elucidating really what is at stake uh, in this hearing today, and that is about public access and transparency. Uh, Ted summarized it absolutely wonderfully about the need for having uh, uh, the tape and the, uh, released in terms of the integrity of the judicial process. When you see the accusations that had been made with respect to uh, Judge Walker, how he's conducted himself during the course of the trial, and the very, without any evidence whatsoever, 
the um, allegations that have been made by the opponents of marriage equality to undermine the legitimacy of this decision, which was based on nothing but the facts and the law, uh, despite what they say, I think that only highlights the importance that the transparency that would be furthered by the release of the tape goes to the heart of what is at stake in this case, and that is the integrity of a decision that has vast import for millions and millions of Americans. And I have to tell you, I think it's um, just like I think the fact that we uh, had this trial here in San Francisco, I can't think of a better place to have a hearing on this matter than here in San Francisco. Because in an era when you see increasing cynicism in the public, nationwide, about the integrity of government, about what politicians do, about the structures of government, we have a tradition here in San Francisco of open government. We have been a leader in, sending, in, in uh, setting out sunshine laws, public records laws, and the like, which has inspired uh, the confidence of San Franciscans as to the integrity of local government. And that is exactly what is at stake here, in this case, on a much broader scale. And uh, I, I was very impressed with uh, the deliberativeness and the thoughtfulness with which Judge Ware uh, approached uh, uh, the hearing today, but quite frankly I was incredibly surprised as to uh, the lack of preparation or argument that I saw out of Mr. Thompson. And quite frankly, perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised because it replicates what we have seen throughout this case, and that is the failure to put forth a substantive case in any meaningful way. So um, I thought that the issues were laid out there clearly. Uh, I think that we all understand what is at issue and the importance of transparency uh, and integrity of the judicial process that will be served uh, by uh, lifting the stay. So, Chad? We're going to go to questions, but I know some of you have asked us uh, prior to today and, and, and earlier this morning. On September 19th, the American Foundation for Equal Rights will be premiering um, a Broadway uh, reading and reenactment, a trial, um, a play that was written by Academy Award winning writer Dustin Lance Black, uh, where each of the members uh, from Judge Walker to the attorneys on both sides to the expert witnesses and to our plaintiffs, who will all be played by Academy Award winning and Emmy nominated actors from Morgan Freeman to Marissa Tomei, um, and that will be recorded and ultimately made available. Um, but that premieres on September 19th, um, and I know a, a, a number of, of you have, have covered that, um, but some of you hadn't and, and had asked questions. But that is September uh, the 19th uh, at the O'Neill Theater uh, in Manhattan. Ted, can I ask you um, what about Thompson's argument that um, they ha had relied on what he called ironclad assurances that the video would just be used by Judge Walker in his chambers for his own review. <coughs> that argument, when we come to the question whether the judicial record should be released, is wrong. And it, it, there's a real difference. The judge said the purpose for reporting the trial was the judge was going to use it in chambers. At that point, Mr. Thompson and the proponents should have known that if we have a judicial record that's created, then these principles of access that allow the news organizations and the public to get access to documents comes into play. And uh, the judge, you know, they, they've turned it into this ironclad vow. The judge did say that was why he was going to make the recording, but um, that doesn't mean that the traditional principles of access to judicial documents uh, isn't applicable. It's applicable here, and, and, and Mr. Thompson had no rational, compelling, or any kind of reason to keep this secret that I could hear today. So we think those basic principles, these aren't new rules. These are, these are the rules that govern all the records in this courthouse. That's all we're asking to be applied uh, for the proceedings that took place in a public courtroom to be released. As the judge pointed out, that whatever he decides is not really going to affect the plaintiffs in this case. Um, would you agree that this is more in some ways about public opinion an image uh, around both the, uh, the proponents of Prop 8 and also the larger issue of gamer. The release of the video will definitely have an effect on the public debate on same-sex marriage. There's no question of that. It will increase public understanding and, and knowledge of what happened in the in trial. But it does affect the plaintiffs because our clients, two couples who want to get married, came into court. They put themselves on the stand, they went. They came into court and stood up for something they believed in. These proponents, their only response is to attack the proceeding. 
and to try to undermine confidence in that process. So I think for our clients, it means a lot for the public to see this was a fair trial that both sides put their evidence on. The proponents didn't have any evidence. That's why they lost. So it means a lot for our clients as well as to the public. Are you at all concerned about what the judge had raised about um, the seal perhaps meaning that this, the video tape could not be viewed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals? Or, is that something that occurred to you? Was that obvious to you? <laughs> <laughs> like, the reaction was? like the judge, I was surprised that Mr. Thompson suggested that because um, of course the Ninth Circuit can, can review a piece of the record, play a piece of the record. This local rule that Mr. Thompson has converted into the, the rule that trumps all other rules in the Constitution does not control the Ninth Circuit. Mr. Thompson seemed to back off on that later in the case. But what I found interesting was the passion, the, the, the vehemence that Mr. Thompson was expressing about the need to keep this secret. This isn't state secrets. This isn't radioactive material. This is just what happened in open court in this courthouse that many or all of you saw happen. And the notion that they're fighting so hard to keep it secret without any explanation. And the one point I just would add, I mentioned this, right now posted on the court's uh, website uh, is videotaped testimony from two of the plaintiff's experts who they withdrew before the trial because they knew their testimony was bad for them but the proponents' witnesses are on videotape on the court's website. How can they complain about letting the rest of the record out? I don't think they can. Could you explain exactly what Rule 77.3 is, where it comes from, and how it relates, and why he was so vehement with it? Sure. Br briefly, that is the rule that governs uh, broadcasting uh, proceedings from the courthouse, televising and broadcasting for public uh, consumption. That was the rule that was at issue and has now been amended to include a pilot project that does allow for some broadcasting. In fact, Chief Judge Ware uh, asked the parties if they would agree to use that new rule to broadcast today's hearings, but the proponents objected. They wanted to hide the fact that they were trying to hide the trial. Um, the, the rule only talks about the, the rules for taking photographs, broadcasting like It doesn't speak at all to what happens once there is a record of a proceeding. Once there's a record, that triggers the First, first Amendment, excuse me, scared myself with this <laughs> microphone, the, the First Amendment and common law presumptions. That's where Mr. Thompson, I think, got off track. He kept conflating the two and not recognizing the, the big difference between the issues relating to live broadcast or even delayed broadcast and the public's fundamental right of access to judicial records. That The latter is what we were talking about today. Those principles strongly support releasing the videotape. Which court's going to ultimately decide this question, do you think? I mean, will it get all the way up to the state supreme or? This would go, this issue about the release of the videotape, um, you heard Mr. Thompson ask for a stay, and, and therefore he's indicating they will appeal it. So if they appeal, the next stop would be the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit has very strong rules. The Supreme Court on access to judicial records as opposed to televising proceedings. Um, has very strong rules about openness and transparency, and, uh, and, and it sounds like the proponents, like all the other issues in this case, plan to uh, to appeal if the, the, the video is released. But we, we think that the law strongly supports our side on these issues. But the state Supreme Court, you think, will It would actually be the Ninth Circuit. It would be the federal. Oh, I'm sorry, federal yeah, the federal. Okay. Yes. But it, it'll stay there, do you think? Um, it, it, it depends what happens. Um, and, and in terms of these issues, these are basic issues that the Ninth Circuit, the Supreme Court can look at if they, if the Supreme Court is discretionary, if they determined it was a, an issue. And the circumstances are quite different now than when we were talking about the live broadcast, as I laid out today in court, and as, as uh, Ms. Van Aken and Mr. Burke talked about, here we have the record, and without any evidence of any problems related to the trial, it was a very cordial, civil proceeding, um, and there's no evidence that in anything except the most positive consequences would flow. The public would get to see what happened, hear what happened, right from the mouths of the witnesses themselves, from the lawyers, from the judge. That would be benefit everyone, including everyone on both sides of the debate about same-sex marriage. So you think that's what they uh, are afraid of? Yes, in a word. We think, <laughs> we think, and I've had this experience personally, when I talk to someone and, and lay out the issues and they hear the, the, our side of the arguments, if they come into it neutral, even sometimes uh, think going against the, the notion that there should be marriage equality, once they hear 
the arguments of our side, of the plaintiff's side, about how Prop 8 is discriminatory, how it serves no purpose, how it hurts children, how it hurts families. And you, they hear that, um, as we played today, the lead witness for the proponent saying that we would be more American the day we recognize same-sex marriage, it, it, can, it can change people's minds, it changes their perspectives, and I think that's the bottom line. That's why the proponents don't want this out. They know that when the public sees the evidence on both sides, um, they're going to lose the, the public opinion battle just as they lost this case. I'd like to ask a question about the standing hearing next week, if, you know, if that's okay, or would you rather wait till afterwards? Yeah. Either way, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know we talked about this, uh, and Ted Olson, I guess, will be arguing on Tuesday, but, and you spoke to it on the phone the other day, but since we've got you here, could you just summarize why you think that uh, they do not have legal standing to challenge this, uh, this decision? Certainly. The fundamental rule of standing in federal court is that to have standing to proceed, to bring a case, to bring an appeal, you have to show that you were injured. And here, the proponents themselves are on record that they ha can't identify harm to themselves or to anybody else by, uh, the, enact by the enactment of marriage equality and, and by allowing everybody to get married. They have no harm. They have no standing. And, and with respect to these ballot initiatives, because the governor and attorney general had determined that to respect the decision of Judge Walker, and not enforce Proposition 8 or defend it on appeal, uh, that leaves the proponents as the, the last people willing to do that. But under standing rules, they, their injury is too speculative or non-existent to give them standing. And if the, uh, if the state Supreme Court ultimately rules against them, do you see that as the end of the road, basically? It would make it almost impossible for them to show standing when they get back to the Ninth Circuit. On the other hand, if the California Supreme Court finds that they have standing under, under California law, that still doesn't answer the full question of Article Three standing in federal court. So it would be then for the Ninth Circuit to factor that into its analysis as to the Article Three standing. It's, it's For us, I think I've said this before, we're not afraid of getting to the merits on appeal. So whatever the California Supreme Court decides in the Ninth Circuit, if there's standing for the proponents, we think we'll win on the merits. If there's not standing, then Proposition 8 falls and marriage equality will will reign in California. So those are two pretty good alternatives, and we're looking forward to moving now forward quickly with that process to establish marriage equality in California and, and hopefully everywhere else. Thank you very much.